Welcome, welcome everybody to our Meet the Arts and Sciences Champion event. Uh, Amalia and I are thrilled to be able to introduce you to our new champions and ask them some questions about all of their wondrous and wonderful things. Um, so why don't we do a uh, quick introductions? Uh, do we want to introduce the old champions? Like, do we think they know us and are bored of us already? What do you think? Uh, we'll just do a quick one. Amalia. It never hurts to introduce. Yeah. <laughs> all right, Amalia. I am Amalia. Yep. I'm Amalia von Hohenzey, um, current, what, what are our titles? I'm always confused. Am I Sovereign's Champ? I'm the Sovereign's Champ and you You're are Sovereign's the, Champ and I'm And you are the Crown's yes. Champ. And, and we can talk about the trivia of why that is. Yes, yeah. Excellent. All right. Fiori, on to you. I am Fiore Leone Tabardi, and I am the Sovereign's Champ of Arts and Science. And we now have a very, very confusing I get to introduce you the Sovereign's Champion of uh, Arts and Science, newly minted, who is? Jan Janovich Bogdansky, though, though I think I'm still designate. I, I don't know, we actually, we haven't actually handed things over yet, have we? We haven't. We're, this is a rare moment in East Kingdom history where we are four champions. We have uh, champions in waiting, which is a, I feel, a very yeah. cool thing. Yes. I feel like we should do something like we have this critical mass of champion. There should be some big event. Mm. <laughs> All right. And last but certainly not least, our new consort champion of arts and sciences. I'm Sugawara no Neme. Excellent. So Welcome. to get Welcome everybody for coming and welcome everybody who gets this um, video. Uh, why don't we just start with the naming convention? Like what happened to the naming convention for our champions? So a couple of things happened. The SEA changed the way it treats sovereign titles. So instead of thinking of just kings and queens, now we think of sovereigns and consorts, which is great change. But of course, Amalia and I were both uh, recognized as ANS champions by uh, Her Excellency the Countess Margarita, who was at that time Her Royal Majesty. And so having one sovereign who was in fact the crown, we had a crown's champion of arts and science, Somalia, and a sovereign's champion of arts and science, which was my title at the time. Well, I guess they still are. But having now recognized two new champions of arts and science under our wonderful sovereigns, the councils of the East, we have a sovereigns champion and a consorts champion. And we will, I guess, adapt conventions as we need to moving forward. Excellent. Um, let us kind of, and uh, if anybody has questions about anything as we're going on, there are a few of us on the call today. So you uh, lucky few can ask questions willy nilly without really much to do. Um, and if you are wanting to stay off camera because you don't want to be in the recording, you can still unmute yourself if you would like to ask a question or just type it in the chat if you don't want to reveal your voice to the populace, you know, however it works. All right, Amalia, would you like to start the questions? Or you like me too or sure so yeah we um we wanted to ask you both to talk a little bit about the specific project that you did for uh this this particular competition so sugawara you did your your amazing costuming um piece and jan you did your your beautiful um your paintings so if you could each talk a little bit about what into those projects how you planned it how when did you start working on it how long did it take just give us give us some some background information about what inspired this and a little bit about the process why don't we start with jan and if either okay, I was gonna say, so who goes first i'm gonna I am throwing Jan under the bus. <laughs> That's fine. Excellent. That's fine. Um, so I got into, it, it, it kind of goes like this. Um, I got into the whole painting thing um, a few years ago. Um, and, and it started as, as an icon writing class and, and cross pollinated that with, with just an egg tempera class. And then while I was researching the style medievally, I narrowed into this Italo Byzantine thing. So um, I had done a couple of pieces and approximately a year ago, 
um, I started on the, the St. Michael piece. Um, basically because, you know, real life, you can only do so much and, and things of that nature, but it's a fairly involved process. Uh, the first thing I need to do is make the panels, which is a, a pair of oak panels that you then have to glue together and, and, and get flat in the right, the right size. Um, then is creating the glue and the gesso uh, that you have to treat the panel with. And then comes creating the cartoon and transferring the cartoon to the gesso. And then comes the actual process of creating the art. And you, you start with the gilding, which we'll talk about in, in more in depth later. Um, and then comes the painting. And the thing is with painting, it's not that you paint a color. It's you paint a base color and you paint repeated colors over it, usually in lighter shades to create the actual color that you're looking for. Because uh, going from dark to light, what you're actually working on is thin film diffraction through, through a surface, as, as I learned in physics class in, in college, to create the shades that you're getting. Um, so, you know, uh, I'll, I'll talk uh, about the painting more later, but like a flesh tone starts as green is a really nasty, ugly green. And then you put layers upon layers upon layers of, uh, on that. Um, I finished, well, once I'd gotten it to the point where I thought I shouldn't be painting anymore, which is, as any artist knows, the most difficult part when you say, done, um, came the, uh, I finished with the patterning of the gold, which was actually easier than I, than I expected it to be. And I would say that I finished the entire project sometime in October, um, not to uh, about the time that it was, you know, ready to enter the, 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 the competition itself. So it was a number of, you know, I, I would usually try to do an hour or two of painting every night, um, though that got tedious it, it, because you can only get so far and I want to do more and I need to stop. So yeah, I started sort of banking that into weekends that, that I would work on it, but it was, it was a pretty uh, long and involved process. Excellent, thank you for sharing that with us. All right, Sugawa, why don't you tell us a little bit about your project? All right. So my project, um, um, I had made a traveling outfit 13 years ago for a crown list. Um, but it was all cotton and machine sewn, and um, it was a great first attempt. Um, I've done a lot of research in the past over a decade and um, had learned a lot more. And then the Calenteer Clothing Challenge came up, um, and I was inspired by the ambitiousness of that um, challenge and decided to enter that. Um, and it was maybe a few days after I decided to enter the Calenteer Clothing Challenge that I found out a, that um, Crown, Crown's ANS Champs was happening. Um, so I decided to, um, when I had laid all of my project out for, um, the, for C3, the Calenteer Clothing Challenge, um, I had broken it down into individual steps um, so that it would be easier to accomplish um, with little bites instead of a big thing staring at me. Um, and with crowns coming up, I actually had to shorten that deadline um, by almost a month. Um, so I rearranged everything and then started just working on it piece by piece, uh, slowly starting with weaving and then moving on to the sewing of each garment. Um, and I started on October 1st. Um, each thing took about a month to complete, um, and I was working between five and 12 hours a day on it, um, and I finished on January 10th and squeaked in and entered just in time. Excellent. Wonderful. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Yeah, thank you. And one of the reasons I wanted to ask about the timelines is because I feel like that's helpful for for folks who might be thinking that they might want to enter in the future. 
about, you know, all right, how, how much work is this going to entail and, and how long should I be thinking about this for? So thank you so much for sharing. That's such helpful information. All right, Fiona, okay. do you want to take the next question? I will take the next question. So our next question is, I will have to open the questions. What were specific parts of the process that stand out for you? And that can be the process of preparing, preparing your project or the process of actually entering in us or even, you know, the competition itself, whichever way you would like to answer that. And uh, we can, why don't we start with Sugawara this time? So um, the part of the process that I enjoyed the most, that stands out the most, um, that gave me the most pleasure was actually planning the project. Um, there's something about organizing everything that helped me get a grasp on the project um, as a whole. Um, and so I laid each and every step out and then broke it down further and further until each little step was something that was, oh, that's no big deal. I can do that little step. And that made it easier to take little steps along a journey instead of having to run a great distance at one time. Um, yeah, it, it, was, it was really enjoyable planning it out. And that was the absolute best part of the process. Um, catching up at the end, I ended up falling behind my production schedule. And so I got a little frustrated towards the end of my project and was sewing for more hours than I care to admit in a day. Um, but the, it was really nice to come to the end and know that all of that preparation was worth it and it really helped accomplish something. Excellent, thank you for that. I love your image of little steps along a journey. That's awesome. All right, Jan. The part the, of, of the process that always stands out for, for me in, 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 in these, because this is like the third or fourth piece that I've done, is, is the painting itself. Um, as I said, the process starts in one place that is not necessarily intuitive to the end goal. Um, I, I love reading through Cianini's uh, writings about how to do this it, because he breaks it down of you know how to paint clothes how to paint flesh tones how to paint um people from africa i believe is the way he puts it how to paint dead people because all of them have a different process to them so i love the process of okay for, especially for flesh tones i know where i'm going okay i start with the green and then comes the and then comes the, and and i know kind of where I'm going with that. For some of the other um, portions of the painting, I have an idea where I'm going to start. And then I have to discover how the colors are going to interact and how the layers are going to interact. And while I was inspired by a, an actual piece, I would go along and say, you know what, I kind of like this better. And, and it becomes a certain amount of discovery of how the colors are going to interact and, and how the aesthetic is appealing to me to create the, the finished piece. So, you know, when, it, when I was working on the armor, I would look at it and say, okay, I think this is how I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this. And then I would try some things and either it would work exactly how I wanted to, or I'd have to adjust a little bit. And I would still end up with something at the end that I go, oh, cool, it worked. Um, and and to me that was that was really the most uh, the, the most enjoyable part. Thank awesome. you so much. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> I so love that you talk about it as a discovery too, because I, I find that as well with my art that it's like uh, these little uh, surprises that come through as you experiment with things. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So I. My next question, I'm going to cheat and take things a little bit out of order here because we've been talking, I know, I know, I'm being so terrible um, because we've been talking about process so much and your specific projects. Um, what would you say is, was the most challenging part and was there something that was surprisingly easy? 
Okay, so we're going to do the reverse order again. Um, sure, I guess I'll go, first. <laughs> go for it, Jan. Um, the the most difficult part for me was the was the gilding. Um, even when I'm doing uh, calligraphy and illumination, gilding is not my thing. Um, when you're doing gilding on a panel, you're doing it on something called Ar Armenian bowl, which I usually purchase as as a finished product. It's basically mud mixed with glue. Um, and, and you get this nice foundation that you then sand to do almost a glassy finish and you gild on that. Um, usually doing the, the technique of you just sit there and you bring it up to your face and you blow on it to activate the glue and then you can stick the, the, the gold to it. Well, I didn't have any ready-made, so I had to find my own recipe for, um, for the Armenian bowl. So that was a little bit of investigation and I ended up with uh, the process used usually by, by icon writers, which is known as wet gilding, uh, which is a slightly different technique, not one that I'm used to, and it didn't work the same way. So my gilding went from something that is something of a struggle to, oh my God, I just want to tear my eyes out. Um, but eventually, again, you, you reach a certain point where it's like, okay, now I know how this is working. Now I know how it's going. And I was able to, to get it down in, in the wet gilding because with the wet gilding, what you do is you then, you have the Armenian bowl that, that you paint down and, and sand down. To activate it, you create another solution, which has some of the mud um, and some alcohol in it. And you essentially paint a, an, an area and stick the gold to it. Um, so it's a lot wetter process than, than what I'm used to. But eventually I was able to, to get it down and, and move that along. So that was, that was the challenge. The one that turned out a lot easier than I expected was the patterning. Um, I don't, in my investigation looking, looking at patterned gold, I have the feeling that the people who did it all the time had stamps, like leather stamps, to, you know, make these patterns and those patterns and the other, you know, they went over to the thing and I needed this and this and this and they go in and they pattern it. I don't have that. So I ended up grinding my own tools and then creating the patterns as, as I could see them. And it was just like, okay, I can't do that, but I think I can do that. And that became almost too easy. It was like, okay, there's my outline. There's my pattern. Wow, it worked. And, and it was just like, Boom, and, and that was it. And, and for that to be the end of the project as well, that was like the, the, the great denouement of like, Fini. That is wonderful. All right, Sugawara. What was the challenge and what was easy? So um, I actually designed my entire project to be incredibly ambitious. Um, I did a lot of things for the first time. Um, it's my first ANS competition, my first hand sewn garments, um, the first time I was translating from Japanese, which I neither read nor speak. Um, so it was, and it was also a lot to do in a short amount of time. Um, but all of that with the process that I used to break it down wasn't, while it was challenging, it didn't frustrate me too much. Um, the most challenging part was actually finishing the project, but not just because of finishing it. Um, halfway through the project, I took a class and that class blew up my research. Um, I realized that I had mistakes in the layout of my project. I was missing a garment. I was missing an accessory. I hadn't sewn one of the garments properly. Um, and it absolutely devastated me to find out that I was, that the, all these things were wrong, that I had all these mistakes. So it was very humbling and very challenging to finish the project, knowing that I had all these flaws in it um, because I didn't have time to change them. So I included it in my documentation and created a plan to change it later, but it was very humbling to create something knowing that it wasn't quite right. Um, the easiest part, um, I had done some hand sewing mending before, but never full garments. So 
I found that not only was it fairly easy to hand sew, it was very enjoyable and relaxing. Um, so that was, that was a very pleasant part to find. Fantastic, thank you. And I, I think it's so important for people to realize that even people who are creating art at a very high level will find places things that are hard for them. Um, at, at, at every level, artists can challenge themselves. And Sugawara, I love that you sought out a challenge. And Jana, I love that you had to, you know, sort of, you, you had a process that you were used to and you had to find a different way because you didn't have that material. So it's, that's really cool that, that you both really, you drove yourself to go farther than you had gone before. And that's really cool. Very cool. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm loving these stories, like the, the inside, uh, inside the uh, artist studio, as it were. All right, so I'm going to go back. <laughs> All right. Uh, did you interact with the Ministry of Arts and Science, either the web page or people or with the rubric before the competition? Um, and if so, how did that work for you? Uh, wh how was it interacting with the rubric either before or during the competition? And I think we're on Sugawara's turn this time. So I most definitely took full advantage of uh, the services that the MOAS office had offered. Um, I had taken a rubric class a couple of years ago, um, and that got me interested in competition here in the East. Um, and then once I decided to enter, I started devouring information. Um, I watched both of the rubric classes twice. I watched the entire slate of classes that's on the YouTube channel for um, setting up an ANS entry. Um, and it was incredibly important for me to go through. I wanted to make sure, I mean, it was my very first ANS competition. So I wanted to make sure I was fully prepared and knew what I was getting in myself into. Um, so once I had my documentation kind of in order, which um, was actually inspired by uh, Fiore's class on how to present your ANS uh, project to the world. I highly recommend that class as well. Um, so, oh, and I've lost my train of thought. You're fine. You're fine. Take a breath. <laughs> um, we were talking about interacting with the uh, MOAS and all that. So uh, I used uh, Nobodana Fiore's class to set up my documentation. And once I had it in a rough draft, I actually sent it to Mistress Elena and she read it over for me and provided me with a lot of commentary. And I went through and each comment corrected my documentation, added sources, um, took all of her suggestions into account. Um, and if I hadn't, I am a firm believer that if I had not interacted with the MOAS office and taken and watched the classes and done all that, I would not be sitting here today on this panel. It, it's what got me here. Awesome. Well, that warms my heart. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, Jan. And I'm going to take the exact opposite track in that I didn't really, um, at least not directly. This is the second, third time that I've entered ANS Champions. And the first time was just one of those things. I had some things. It was close by. Sure, why not? Um, the last one I did, um, which was the one where I entered the, the Madonna and Child, which was, which was still just like with barely made within the three year uh, time limit to, to have it be a supporting piece for this one. Um, I got a lot of really good feedback on my documentation and my presentation and things of that nature. So I used that feedback to feed into what I was doing, not necessarily what I was doing, but the way I was presenting and the way I was documenting it this time. So it wasn't a, a direct interaction at all. Um, my, uh, my, my theory on it is 
that I didn't, I didn't want to write to the test. Um, I didn't want to read the rubric and, and see how I could do this, do that, or, or something along those lines. I wanted to create the art and then present it within the context that they have, not necessarily moving the context into what I was creating. Um, when it comes to the documentation, I write documentation a lot for my mundane job. I've, I've done a ton of research papers when I was in college and I, and I keep up with that type of thing. My wife being the genealogist has to present her research in a certain way. So I would write my documentation and then allow her to you know, look at the way I cite things and things of that nature. And then I would, like I said, I would feedback the things that I was told at the last a &S competition into, into that as well. So it wasn't a, a direct link between uh, the MOAS and, and the rubric and what I was doing, but I did have some of those things in mind as, as I was uh, finishing my, th my project. Excellent. Yeah, and, I think there's, mm -hmm. go, oh, go ahead, Amalia. I was, gonna I was say, just gonna say, say that. Oh, you, you say first and then I'll say. Um, I was just going to comment that, that, um, that even though you both took different paths with, with the, the rubric, you were both responding to feedback and, and using that to, to look critically at your work. And that, I think really, it shows your openness as an artist and your openness to grow. And I think that's, that's something that is it that we look for that's important as, um, in, in choosing champions and, and as people progress throughout the art world, not only your skill, but your openness to receive feedback, to embrace it, to, and, and not all feedback is necessarily useful, but to, to listen to it with open ears. Um, so that, that was a, a great perspective to hear from each of you. It's different and yet similar. Well, if we're going to, you know, just converse here, that's, that's the way you're going to get better. You know, I, I have, you know, being a peer myself, I do not have an, an arts peer relationship, but I have peers within the arts community who work with me in, in sort of a mentorship type of scenario. So I will show them things and go, this is where I am. This is what I'm thinking about. And, and I get honest feedback because that's what I'm looking for. And sometimes it's brutally honest feedback. And sometimes my own feedback to what I'm looking at when, when I reach what we call the weasel spit stage of the project. And the response is, no, that's not what you're seeing. That may be what you think you're seeing, but that's not what, you're, what is actually there. So that, you know, that works on both sides of that. Yeah, yeah that's really I, cool to have those relationships. And yeah. just one more thing I wanted to add was, okay. if people are feeling intimidated by the idea of receiving feedback, we just, we do have a class on the, um, EK YouTube channel, um, Mr. Selena did consent in ANS. So I just wanted to plug that if people are not sure how to engage in feedback, if they're wanting to uh, receive it or give it, uh, that's a great place to go. Yeah, and I, I was, uh, you know, I, I'm, I could pile onto everything that people have said, but I wanted to add the component of difference in how you wanna interact with the materials and difference in how you wanna receive feedback and different in how much you want or how little you want. Uh, all those variations are available. So I, I love that you both had very different engagements uh, because that's the reality. Even uh, as we look at Amalia and I in our discussion with Council with the Councils, we have very different ways that we came to to our projects as well. So I think that it's, uh, for me, important that everybody see that there is no one way to do this. All right, let's ask another question. All right, so I believe next up is uh, talking a little bit about what your hopes are for your years as champion or your year, your years collectively, both of you together as champion. Jan, go for it. Yeah, I think, I, I think I'm up. Um, first of all, to actually meet people. I'd, I'd love to meet Sue Yuar so I can talk to her about, about this. Um, but, you know, we're, we're all in that though. Um, a couple of things that, that, I've, that I've come to mind thinking about this. Um, I'm in somewhat of a unique position of, of being a martial peer um, as an arch champion. 
And I'd like to use that opportunity to dissuade some stereotypes on either side of that fence um, about both the arts and the martial communities. Um, I know a number of people in the martial community who are fantastic artists. Um, I know that they don't necessarily present their art a lot. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. So some of them do a lot. Um, but there are very few of us who are necessarily seen equally in the martial and, and the arts community. Like Kenrick is, is one that comes to mind who is, who is seen very much equally in both. Um, so I'd like to get some of my friends on the martial side to you know, pony up some of, some of their art a bit more so people in the arts community can, can see the, the martial community in a slightly, uh, slightly different light. Um, and, and lastly, there's a, a very, very personal thing for me. Um, before, you know, you know, in the intervening time, but before shutdown and things of that nature, um, one of the last tournaments I got to enter was uh, Rattan Champions back in, in the prior June before shutdown. And in that tournament, I, I lost in the finals to my dear buddy, Horik who we practiced together. We, I, I knew him back when he was king and, and beforehand and things of that nature. And, and I was just so happy for him and then things of that nature. And, and he was you know, taken from us anywhere by a, an impaired driver. And there's a part of me that just wants to be a good champion now that he can't be. Um, and, and do a certain, you know, I don't want to say that I'm going to do it in his memory or anything, uh, you know, quite like that, but there's something about the champion that he was in the back of my mind, trying to be the champion that, that I'm going to try to be. That's really beautiful. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, I, I, I got Misty too. All right. Sugawara, what would you like your year to be? Um, I would like to stir up inspiration in the kingdom. Um, I derive so much joy from drilling down into my chosen area of study, into the Heian period of Japan. It gives me so much fulfillment. And I would like to encourage others to find something like that for themselves so they can really delve into something deeply and take part in it and get in touch with their persona or their art or history in a way that they hadn't before. Um, yeah, I, I really want to stir that up in the kingdom and get people excited. Yeah, that's super fun. If you'd like an accomplice. <laughs> Yes, please. <laughs> this is one of the things I find fun. So I'm, I'm happy to stand behind the champion and, you know, make noise. All right. Uh, our next question. Oh, I'm going to ask a, a very, very, very serious question. What is your favorite dessert? Mochi. Oh, it's very on brand. It's very on brand. paste filled mochi. Yes, please. <laughs> yes. Okay. It's very on brand. We're gonna we're gonna accept mochi. Let's hear from. <laughs> let's hear from, Jan. Let's see if we can get. You 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 and you and my daughter <laughs> should have loves mochi as well. Um, it, 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 when I saw this question, it's like, okay, are are we talking mundane or medieval? Um, on on. On the mundane side, the problem is I don't have a favorite dessert. Um, at, at Christmas time, um, Rosamund makes uh, a bouche de Noël that is just off off the charts. Um, I've got a soft spot in my heart for uh, my mother used to make a lemon meringue pie. It was just <gasps> mm, wonderful, and. I, I had the opportunity to, to be an exchange student uh, when I was much younger and I got turned on to Brittany cake, which is just so, so wonderful. Um, and, and my wife makes it for me now for my birthday. So I love that. 
Um, on, on the medieval side, fine cakes, which are essentially uh, shortbread, or uh, torun uh, pertineki, which are Polish medieval uh, gingerbread. So if we're gonna do the on brand, <laughs> that's mine. <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, so so hopefully everybody's taking notes about the the desserts <laughs> that can be provided to our champions, you know, as bribery. I mean, um, offerings. We'll call them offerings <laughs> as we move forward. Okay. Um, can I be cheeky and ask a question that's not on our list? <laughs> I'm totally for it. I I, awesome. I support. So um, Jan had talked a little bit about um, how he is involved not only in the arts community, but he is an, also um, uh, a martial peer. And so I was wondering if you could each talk a little bit about your journeys um, in the SCA that are not necessarily ANS related. Um, to have you done martial work or service work or uh, taken part in the SCA other than the arts and then how if that came first, how did the arts kind of creep in to your uh, SEA experience? Wow, and, 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 and it's my turn to be first this time, great. Um, I joined the SCA in, in college. And of course, the, the thing that I saw first at the demo was the fighting. Um, but I, I always blame my father for my SCA journey because when I was a kid, he used to say, you know what, if I ever, if I ever had a lot of money and, and didn't know what to do with it, I'd love to open a restaurant, call it Henry VIII's. And it would be long tables. And, and he described what amounts to um, medieval times, the, the, the restaurant chain. So I came back from that demo at college and literally picked up the phone, called home and said, dad, I found it. So to me, the SCA was, was like an alternative medieval lifestyle, and I wanted to do all of it. Um, within a few months of me joining the SCA, I was cooking my first event. Um, I was fighting. I was the Minister of Sciences, which tells you how long ago this was, because there was separate arts and sciences office um, the next year. So I got into games. Um, so my, my journey was all of the things that I was interested in doing all at the same time. And I remember going to a fighter's practice in Bukale long ago and far away. And Mistress Gabriella, who had just stepped down as tiger clerk, who I was working with doing signet work because I've been doing signet work since a long time ago. Um, said to me, you're gonna have to choose one. You can't pursue fighting, you can't pursue ANS and expect to get there. And instead of taking that advice as, oh, I should choose one, I took that as a challenge. So I continued to aspire in the fighting field and continued to do calligraphy and illumination, continued to work in kitchens, I do archery. My 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 daughter got me turned into onto fencing because she was a high school fencer. Um, in the in other arts, I do woodworking because I need furniture to sit on if I'm going to be at the tournament. And so it became all the things that I needed to do. And and like I said, it's sort of an alternative lifestyle. My my vision of the SCA when I started was that you're visiting somebody's, you've been invited to the manor house of your neighbor and you're going there for the feast and the festivities and the games and you should have all of that stuff as, as part of it. So I pursued all of the stuff and, and back to some of the stuff that, that Sugawara was, was talking about. Um, Count Reese of Harlech, one of the, one, the person who created the King's Order, now Sovereign's Order of Excellence, was all about the details. And camping with him for a couple of years got me into the details. You don't know Penzik until you have searched every merchant trying to find the correct 13th century buckles. 
and 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 that just became the pursuit so so my my pursuit became what does the medieval yawn know what does the medieval yawn do what does the medieval yawn think about and that has been the, the story of my pursuit. The medieval yawn has to fight. The medieval yawn needs to be able to shoot, if nothing else, to hunt. The medieval yawn needs to know how to play games, needs to know what's going on in the kitchen. He probably doesn't paint or do C&I work, but you know what? He might have an appreciation for it. So that's that's been my, my road in the SCA. I love that so much. And I love that you asked this question, Amalia. I'm like very excited <laughs> over here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna pass it on to Sukumara. Um, So much like my fellow champion, um, I am very much into a little bit of everything um, and always have been, though um, there are some that I, some bits I haven't focused on as much as I would like, and I am working on that. Um, so I started off in the SCA um, in a, a large but somewhat fringy household that was dedicated to service and new people. Um, so my first event, I sliced my finger cutting onions in the kitchen. Um, <laughs> it was worth it. It was worth it. Um, I have done um, so many things. Um, I once I finally got serious, um, which I discovered that I could have a Japanese persona and I became serious. Um, I found my thing and I went after it. Um, I did a lot of service in event stewarding, um, feast crowding, um, and I served as uh, an ANS officer and the quartermaster for my old barony. Um, and it was really rewarding to serve in those capacities. Um, and I dabbled in calligraphy and illumination like my fellow champion does um, and uh, kept into the kitchens. And I had the same thing told to me that, you know, you need to pick a lane and drive through and get to where you're going. And I just don't like that idea. I think you can do whatever suits your fancy um, and whatever makes you happy. Um, and one thing I am getting back into, and I, I'm going to admit it, um, this noble woman is actually going to start fighting. Um, I had authorized 12 years ago um, and I've started, I've, I've picked my Naginata back up and I'm going to see what I can do with it. Um, I just, there's so much that the SCA has to offer and there's no reason to not try a little bit of everything. This is all very incredibly cool. I'm like, I, hopefully nobody can see all of my crazy facial expressions while you guys are talking because I am just incredibly excited for both of you and um, to see you kind of do fun, pixie like jumping around the SCA. <laughs> it's going to be awesome. All right. Uh, I should I ask a question? Now I feel the pressure. Should I ask a question from the list? Should I go off list? Um, I'll, I'll say this. Uh, what What do you wish people would know or consider before they enter in this competition? So I, I think I'm first, yes? Yes, 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 sorry. Right. Um, so you don't have to do it alone. You do not have to do it alone. There is help out there. All you have to do is ask. Um, and you don't even quite have to ask. If you share what you're doing and your excitement about it, other people will be excited too and then offer help to you potentially. So uh, yeah, you don't have to do it alone. Ask for help. There are resources available. There are people that are excited about things. Um, talk to me. I'll be happy to give you some kind of help. I'd, whatever it takes. I'd, I want people to find their joy and really, yeah, you don't have to do it alone. Wonderful. Thank you for that. 
and, and to you, dovetail too. on that completely, um, when you're when you've got that joy, when you've got that passion, there's nothing to be afraid of. Because your enthusiasm, your passion, all of that will show through. And, and the people who are looking at you, the, the people who are going to critique you, the people who are going to give you feedback are going to recognize that you, this is a thing. This is something that, that is important to you. And they're not going to sit there and bash you. They're going to try to help you along. So, so you know, completely, you know, we're, we're on the same page with this. Show your passion. Show your passion. And people will help you, and it's not that intimidating. Wonderful. Thank you for that. All right, we have just about 10 minutes left. So I want to just uh, float out for whoever has arrived in the interim in the call. If you happen to have a question and would like to um, ask our ANS champions about just about anything, uh, put it in the chat. And as long as it's clean and within our, our power, we will ask it. <laughs> All right. Um, I guess I have a question. Off oh, wait, it's your turn to ask a question, Amalia. Oh, well, um, actually, so you go for it, Fiore, because then I have kind of a, a unique, I was going to turn it around and ask if the champions had questions for us. Oh, I like that too. All right. So I uh, have a question about uh, what other art forms do our champions practice? Because I happen to know that um, each of them was uh, recognized for a particular excellence in art, but that is not their only artistic area. So I wanted to talk to them a little bit about what else they do in the arts community. And I think we're Jan first. Yes, yes. Um, in the East, especially, I'm primarily known for my calligraphy and illumination, um, as I've been working for the Signet office for um, score years or more. Um, aside from that, uh, I do turned work. Um, I do turned bowls and plates and things of that nature. I also turned chess pieces uh, and, and game sets. I build furniture, uh, chairs. I'm, I'm working on a chair for my lady right now. I do some brewing. Um, I also do embroidery. I think that covers it. Yeah, I was fishing for embroidery because yeah. I, it is one of my favorite things about the Embroiderer Scola is to walk into the Scola and see Jan working on something huge. So, <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, it, it's a piece that's going to be a, uh, a cushion for, for my lady wife because she finds that uh, her 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 delicate body does not like sitting on wood for long uh, periods of time. Um, so it, especially in the in the old site, there's the the area behind the fireplace that has wonderful light for most of the day. And as as these have gone bad, I'm usually wearing two sets of these to be able to to do close work these days. Um, so yeah, everybody's come to know that Jan's going to be sitting in the back working on. Uh, Working, working on the seat for for his lady. Yeah, and so I've got I've got both lions done, and I'm now about halfway through the first set of foliage on the one side. Excellent. So my super secret yawn embroidery story is my very first event I went to here in the east by myself was that embroider scola, and I am an introvert like hardcore. So I walked into the room, and there were so many people talking, and I just saw you embroidering quietly by a fireplace. And I just went and sat near you. <laughs> and I was like, I am with a person. I am not being antisocial. I'm with that guy. And it was great because you like looked at me and you smiled and then you kept on stitching and I could ease into the room. So that's my super secret Jan story. <laughs> All right. So Gora, tell us a little bit about your other artistic pursuits. Um, so, of course, I, I sew, um, and I do uh, kumihimo, Japanese braiding. Um, I enjoy illumination quite a bit. Um, I am working on my calligraphy. Um, let's see. Um, I am, outside of all of this, a carpenter, so um, I have a few wood projects that um, are, they're not even near a burner yet, but they'll get there. Um, <laughs> um, and I like 
let's see, I've got a fan project I'm working on. Um, there's so many neat little things. Um, oh, music. I am trying, I, I dabble a little with the shakuhachi. Um, I can make it make noise but, and not, not noise. I can make it make pretty sounds. Um, yeah. And anything okay. else that I, I'm very ooh shiny. Let's try that. Ooh, how about Tanka? Can you tell us about Tanka? Uh, okay, so poetry is a passion of mine. Um, I am currently in a, a large project working on writing 1000 Tanka in a year. Um, and Tanka are a form of Japanese poem. Um, it's, uh, so if you're familiar with haiku, that's 575. And a Tanka is 57577. So it's a little longer. Um, and yeah, those, those make me happy. I, I write poetry every day for that. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. All right, I'm going to kick it over to Amalia. Awesome. So as I uh, hinted at earlier, I wanted to open it up to our, uh, our champions in waiting. If you had questions for uh, the outgoing champs about our experience or, you know, any, any questions you might have that might help you in your year. I am, it, it's not so much advice. I'd like to hear about a magic moment that each of you had as champion. That is an awesome question. <laughs> you have to think for a second. Fiore, do you have a magic moment that comes immediately to mind? You know, interestingly, I have many. I think um, my favorite, favorite moments have been uh, in classes. So we've been forced into this virtual environment for this year. I think it, it's a very unique experience to, to be a champion virtually. Um, but uh, I was uh, in the course of one of the rubric trainings classes, I was able to see that light bulb go on where like you're explaining something to someone and suddenly it's not the knowledge that you've imparted. They just have it, they know it. And, um, and when it comes to arts and science and what we're trying to help people in terms of empowering them to have tools, that shift of, I don't know to yes, yes i can and I, I i have so many of those little places that I, it's just been very very fulfilling to be able to do any of that yes absolutely and and i i've so i think i have two magic moments one is very much related to what fiore just said um teaching so prior to um becoming champion i was terrified of teaching <laughs> Um, teaching embroidery. So mundanely, I, I teach music lessons. So I feel, you know, that I felt like that I wasn't qualified enough to teach embroidery because I didn't have a master's degree in that subject. Um, but at when, when the lockdown started, I just said, okay, I just had to bite the bullet. We're, we're doing all these online classes. So I'm just going to do it. And it was magical how much I loved it, what joy it brought me. And yeah, just that seeing the light bulbs go off for for the the people in the classes that was that was fantastic. And then my other magic moment was was in preparing for champs. I took on a project that was so hard I didn't think I could do it. <laughs> and and so when I did it, it it just kind of opened up like it it, it really changed my life. Like I realized that if I put my mind to something, I can actually accomplish it. And there are some major habits in my life that I've been able to change over the past year because, because I realized that if I just put my mind to it, I could do it. And that was, that was incredibly empowering. That made me happy, Amalia. I love that. <laughs> All right. Jan, do you have any questions, comments, thoughts? I'm, I'm going to take the, the, the opposite tack and, and what, what was the, other than the lockdown, what was the hard part? What was especially the unexpected hard part of being the champion? 
Okay, so um, I'll I'll go first since we can, we can throw this back and forth. Um, so th this is a really interesting and I think complex question for me. So I became a new mom 21 months ago, and I had assumed that in becoming a parent that I would have to take a step back. And in a sense, yes, that's true. But um, so I thought that that was going to be the hardest part. Um, so I, I don't know, I, I might be answering your question and I might be doing the opposite. <laughs> Um, so I, I feel like that, that was absolutely a challenge, but because everything went online, I was able to, you know, have a sleeping child on my lap while I taught a class. Um, so that, that was unexpected. So it was a challenge, but it was a challenge that I was able to work with as opposed to simply have to step away because of the challenge. Um, and of course, I missed, you know, not being able to, to stand up in court. Um, I think perhaps one of the biggest challenges in the beginning for me was um, sort of just stealing myself up to just sort of accept that, okay, I am a champion. I should like say stuff as champion and inspire people. And I should just, you know, I have a voice now. I should use it <laughs> instead of being sheepish about it. All right. Uh, you know, that's a, it is a complicated question when we think about challenges. I mean, things have been challenging. I am an introvert like all day long and being very public facing as champion, not just, you know, the champion is there behind the, the thrones, you know, somewhere in the background, but the champion launches herself into the Internet to teach all of these classes. Um, it, it was a lot of forward facing, so that was definitely challenging, but I, I'll I'll tell you that um, that challenge was actually really enriching. The hardest thing for me right now is this part, actually, this transitional part, when the ride's over. So I love to love, love being champion. I am thrilled that we have great champions coming in, but this was the hard part. Yeah, I, I would second that also, Fiore. <laughs> So do we have any other questions, comments from anybody who has attended with us here today? All right, we're gonna call it. Thank you, thank you, thank you for um, coming and talking with us, Jan and Sugawara, and sharing a little bit of yourself with us as we get to know you. And I am super excited to be able to see what you do and and welcome you to this incredible, fabulous ride. And of course, we are 100% at your service. And at some point, there'll be an actual transition. I guess we will, you know, stay tuned. <laughs> but uh, thank you for doing this. And thank you, everybody, for coming and for watching this after the fact. Um, anything else you guys would like to offer before we sign off for the day? At least turn off the recording. All right. I'm gonna... This opportunity, this was fun, but yeah. Excellent. All right. I'm going to shut off the recording and we are back.